all out of hate mail, hate telephone communication. So this is the first time I've heard the name. We just Googled her, apparently she's some kind of handwriting expert. The exciting conclusion to court hearing number four with Lynette, with her attorney Silverman and the judge to Thomas's mad that I'm even posting this right now, not to mention her deposition, which I legally own. And my lawyer is about to drop the biggest bombshell on them. Hopefully uh, Mr. Hale's side of the aisle has gotten the message regarding the need to safeguard witness testimony information. Hopefully Silverman can figure out what actual safeguarding means. We're still in this process of they're trying to figure out when this final hearing is going to be. We're nowhere near the conclusion of this hearing. Big things are about to happen. I can make the first work by moving things around. It's really weird. If someone doesn't go to the doctor very much. I actually have an appointment. Which it's not life threatening. I'll well, just change it. Um, um. I'm more inclined to do the February 9 if you can otherwise accommodate that day. Okay, I just, I would, I can just ask this other judge, Cheeseman is her name. Um, okay, and they can, re they can reach out to this court. If we can reschedule it. So. But if absent that judge, I just know this is a 17 case, I don't think she's gonna. Here's the other issue yeah. that your court, your client needs to be aware of from the court's perspective and consistent with the statutory provisions that mandate upon continuance um, for good cause, the terms of the temporary injunction will remain in effect. This injunction really would mean nothing to me because it's all about contact. And I don't contact Lynette and I don't communicate with Lynette. But the issue is she's trying to get him to say no free speech for him. He can't talk about me. He can't post about me. And yet she's trying to be a public figure. She is a public figure with no less than 13 Facebook pages, illegal pages for the child. It goes on and on and on. And she doesn't want anybody to say anything because you know, hundreds of cars come down the road now, except when Jeremy had the temporary and his uh, freedom of speech was taken away, no cars came down anymore. All lies. Can I be heard on that, Judge? Sure. So, we, you know, you mentioned about the totality of the circumstances. Each pleading, each petition has its say. 50 pages the first time in September, 334 pages in October. Each time it's weighing, it's weighing. The December 4th one, as you said, you know, cumulative effect was it, the barrier, her burden of proof was reached in order to affect, which I think it's strong and clear evidence. I think that's the language for ex-parte. On, on the issue of imminent. Imminent, which okay. Was, which was okay. not But what's sufficient. happened, that, but that was subject, not still subject to cross-examination. She's been asked questions under oath, and she's taken the fifth. Uh, and I think at that point, there's negative inference to make. And I'm, please, Judge, I, 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 this is important because Fair. now I think that at least that, plus the fact that a continuance was effectively done by not allowing the depositions that you ordered not just her, Mr. Cook on the 17th, no show. I think now you have to at least take the fact that she took the fifth, the substantive question, say maybe that lowers it so that we don't reach the burden of imminent and, and the evidence, her burden has not been met. Um, you plead the fifth in a civil case like this, the judge can infer that you in fact are guilty, which is what my lawyer is stating. She refused to answer the questions about this case, which implicates her guilt. Therefore, she's lying. Therefore, Jeremy's not guilty. Yeah, but since that time, so then part of the nature of the initial complaint to be adjudicated by the court is the dissemination publicly of broadcast images and, and documentation, videography, whatever it is, about her that she's claiming is causing her substantial emotional distress. That's to be decided by the court at some point when I get all the evidence. The only person that has caused this woman substantial emotional distress is this woman. All I have shared is exactly what she has said and exactly what she has done. She is the root cause, the only cause for any distress in her life. Right, but Bud Love says that you can still use their name. You can do that as long as you don't have unprotected speech. That's you know, insightful yeah, I, and fighting I'm the, words. And I'm the one that, that not only narrowly tailored it before the 
Bud Love decision. The court then, in conformity with that decision, modified it again to your, right. for your client's benefit in conformity with the law. How can this man sit there on that seat you know, behind that bench and say that he did something for my benefit? He took away my legal right. And then he says with conformity to the law. In other words, what he initially did was broke the law. But it's, a, it's another one of these balancing things, which is two more weeks of your client having the temporary injunction. But what I'm saying is what's happened since entry of this injunction, here's the totality of the circumstances. Okay. On November 29, his attorney, your co-counsel. I can't believe it. Here we go again with the whole Mark Feather thing. Mark Feather is going to have to get an injunction against this judge. This judge is literally obsessed with attorney Mark Feather. When, we, when, I, when the court said, I will accommodate the litigants, I will cancel what I have, we can come back at 9 in the morning. That was 5 p.m. the day before. Your co-counsel said the following, quote, this was, at 11, this was on 11.29 at 4.53 and 15 seconds to 4.53 and 47 seconds. No, Your Honor, Mr. Hales is having to address matters in Ohio court related to this situation. He has to be there tomorrow morning. Yep, and I had a flight the next morning, and I went and dealt with things with the Ohio courts. Nobody said there was a hearing. Now, I understand everything was going quick, and everybody was a, a little on edge, especially the judge. But as my attorney, Feather, is turning to me and saying, how's that look on your schedule? I'm like, I got a flight tomorrow. I got to go home and deal with this stuff with the Ohio court stuff. Nobody said hearing. Nobody ever said hearing. That's what was represented. That's what gained your client a continuance. That was a misrepresentation because on 12-6 at 1.33 and 49 seconds through 1.43 and 45 seconds, current counsel, Mr. Shockett, yourself, and questioning of Mr. Hales on a compliance issue, established that he did not have a court appearance the following morning that in fact he went to Ohio to sign documents two days later in his lawyer's office. That's, that's the first continuance gained on misrepresentations to this court and less than candid representation. Then, 12-1-556, respondent's second motion to continue by Mr. Feather, which was inadequately pled, was filed at the last minute did nothing to establish that it was something that arose between him agreeing to the date of 12-6 and the date that he filed this second motion to continue on 12-1. I'm really tired of the judge misrepresenting things in court. Nobody agreed. My attorney's back was turned to the judge and he's talking to me about the actual scheduling and then the judge adjourns. Good thing we have video. That's the best part of all of this. We can flash back. We're not gonna have it tomorrow because of Mr. Hale's I have other commitments calendar. as well, Your Honor. It's so, Judge okay, Ross. so your calendar and his calendar take priority over the court calendar. We'll be back here Wednesday, December 6th at 1 p.m. We stand adjourned. Anybody see Feather agree? No, nope. me neither. It did nothing to say that something arose unexpectedly that caused him not to be available, and it resulted in then you filing a notice of appearance and saying 24 hours and 20 minutes earlier, I need a continuance because I can't possibly be prepared, which the court again accommodated for Mr. Hales. And Mr. Hales, as I mentioned earlier, hired an attorney he knew could not be prepared. He knew he had a calendar conflict or at least time conflict to be prepared adequately, and he was accommodated. I've got no regrets about that decision. It's in conformity with the law and the circumstances. But the circumstances then included on 12-5, third motion to continue of the respondent. I think that's mine, Judge. That was yours. Yeah. Okay, that was, right. That, so they, they, they were like three days apart. We, he, we heard it on the same day. One I, re, I resolved outside the presence of, of a hearing, which was Feather's motion. Yours we did at subsequent hearing. The fourth motion to continue was the January 4. As I said before, in hindsight, the court felt it was error to allow that, as effectively we were midway through trial. In addition to that, and you guys are very well aware, and these matters are currently under investigation by the state attorney and or the Levy County Sheriff's Office, 
under their obligation under Florida Statute 784.0487. 12.6, there's an allegation for violation of the injunction, which, in, which implicates you, Mr. Shockett. Odd that Judge Craig DeThomasis doesn't mention that it's actually Crook who is breaking the Ohio Civil Protection Orders, which Florida must enforce. 1227, another motion for contempt. 1229, additional motion for contempt. Two of them on January 2nd. There's now contempt proceedings ordered to show cause on Attorney Feather with the Chief Judge of this Eighth Circuit. There's, in addition to all of those moving parts and developments, this court, again to accommodate the respondent, and again, in conformity with the law. This court had previously narrowly tailored the language because there was not any, and I pointed this out in December, I pointed this out, I believe, in November, there was, were no DCA opinions subsequent to the October of 2021 statutory change which added six words, and, and as I pointed out in the footnote in the case of Strober versus Harris, Second District Court of Appeals, when they remanded it back, they said, oh, by the way, the statute changed implying that you need to maybe reevaluate this as the trial court in light of that statutory change. Uh, there's just that little thing called the First Amendment, you know, constitutional law that's been there the entire time. It's the foundation of our country, and it's the one thing that this man's supposed to uphold, and yet he undermined it. Nonetheless, the court narrowly tailored it, again, in conformity with Bud Love, decided by the second DC on December 29, I modified the language again to accommodate him and to not restrict in the balance of things his First Amendment rights. Since then, we now have the posting of unredacted court proceedings from November 29 and 12 6 in violation of Supreme Court orders and this Chief Judge's order. We now learn today, this court now learns today, that there's also been publication and broadcast of a video deposition that was not taken in conformity with 12.310B4 and which has now been disseminated to the public. The consequences to the court include fallout of hate mail, hate telephone communication. Nobody said this judge had to get into the position of a judge. He ran for judge. That's what he wanted. He's a public figure. And as such, he is subject to criticism. How would he like to have my life? I literally get death threats every single day. Some of them from my neighbors. It disrupts the orderly administration of justice. It increases potential harm to the litigant who's brought this action. It includes potential violations of oaths of attorneys or attorney, one who's answering to the chief judge. The court perceives those totality of circumstances as increasing the potential for additional potential harassment and or violations of rules of the court. It also increases the possibility of violations of the terms of the injunction. It increases the possibility because the evidence would show the disclosure of what would otherwise be protected information that should have gone through a redaction process. And in the case of the video depot should have been in conformity with the rules on posting or filing with the court and noticing it in the first place and what appears to be a continuation of the behavior and arguably enhancement increased behavior that is troubling to this court. Wrap your mind around this. This is exactly what Lynette wanted. She wanted her day in court, which is now months. So she comes in, she stalks to Otter Creek, she makes hate pages, she attacks all the residents, all of them. There's not anybody that I think has uh, come out unscathed from all of this. And then she cries, victim, 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 when she's actually exposed. The truth is told. The truth is shown. And she's the victim. And then Judge DeThomasis gives her the day in court. What does he think's gonna happen when somebody who video logs or vlogs their life, what do you think, it's just gonna stop? Freedom of speech, 
Freedom of press. This is the news story of my life. There's enhancement. Of course, it's been going on for four months. I didn't make this happen to me. He and she made this happen to me. This matter needs to proceed to be resolved on February 9th with the temporary terms of the injunction as previously modified needs to remain in effect. It's the only way to assure, and again, I'm not insensitive to the fact that it's two more weeks, Mr. Hales, but in conformity with this court's obligation under the law and based on the totality of those circumstances, and there are more, there were three full hearings, if not four or five different court proceedings where all of it is outlined, as well as what's filed within the court record. The temporary terms of the injunction will remain in effect, as I said, as modified and issued on January 4, 2024. I hope you understand this isn't a battle against an injunction. An injunction on me means nothing. An injunction on me means I can't contact Lynette. I've blocked her on everything months and months and months before. I don't want any contact with her. I don't want her contacting me, which is why we have civil protection orders on her, except they've threatened our lives. We've done nothing but exposed and shared the truth. You don't want to be a part of the program? Don't try and put yourself in my life. She goes on and she goes on and attacks everybody on Facebook groups, the entire town. Nobody, nobody's safe from her. Except, finally, she has shut that pathetic, horrific mouth. $7,000. Man, if I would have known $7,000 for a lawyer would have made her shut up, I would have given her that from the beginning instead of paying over $80,000 on lawyers right now. Nah, I wouldn't have given her anything. So I'm going to direct the clerk to prepare an amended... Excuse me. Not amended. A third extended temporary injunction for protection against stalking with the addendum previously made part of that order which was page five of the seven pages issued on January 4. Mr. Hales, you're directed to comply with the terms of that injunction through February 9. On February 9, we'll adjudicate the merits of the case. With respect to the request for additional depositions, Based on the totality of the circumstances, the request to depose or further depose the petitioner is denied. With respect to the deposition of Mr. Cook, who is not under the control, at least there's no evidence is under the control of Ms. Preston, is just a witness, um, certainly available to both parties. Upon proper subpoena and process, to serve him with subpoena for deposition. I think you mean Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook? Yeah. Did I say Cook? You said Preston. I'm you sorry. Mean, um, you mean John. Mr. Cook. John Cook. Okay. Um, that that deposition, uh, again, if it's uh, taken in conformity with the rules of scheduling a deposition, setting a deposition, noticing a deposition, subpoena for deposition, if it's in conformity with the rules, may take place and needs to be concluded by February 2. Likewise, uh, and I'll build, I'll build an exception for that. I'm going to leave it to counsel. But by February 2, likewise, the deposition requested by petitioner's counsel of the respondent needs to be concluded by February 2. As to the Cook deposition, in part, given what has already been represented as maybe a three-hour productive deposition of the petitioner based in part on the request of counsel for the petitioner seeking about three hours of the respondent based in large part on this court's knowledge of the issues to be litigated and adjudicated. The court will allow the deposition of Mr. Cook to take place up to three hours, but not beyond. That didn't exactly happen. Unfortunately, I can't tell you why yet, as you'll see further in this video deposition of Mr. Hales by the Petitioner's Council up to three hours, but not beyond, that they be completed by February 2nd, unless both counsel agree in writing to another date. I'm actually looking forward to having a little fun with Silverman. 
So you, I, I, I'm giving that. I'm giving you guys that opportunity, so you, you don't have to come back to court to change it if you both are agreeing. You don't need a stipulated order changing this order. So I'm giving you to February 2nd. That should give you another week to get the transcripts if needed. I would suggest you try to when we can re when we um, adjourn for the day, start working towards agreeing on what that date and what those times would be. Um, and if like your calendars, for instance, work and it can happen February 3, you don't have to come back to the court, but you guys have to agree in writing to any change in date. And again, all those depots need to be in conformity with the rules regarding setting depositions and taking depositions. I need to be heard on some judges. I have an expert witness that's going to testify in this case. It's a forensic expert. And I just texted her. Her name is Diane Peterson. And I just texted her. She's not available. Her granddaughter is giving birth. The due date is the 10th. I just had an exchange with her. I don't want this continued, I, but I think she's a material, important witness. Um, where, where is she going to be physically on tennis, the Tennessee. She's in um, whatever that mountain area is north of, in Tennessee, whatever that city is, north of Atlanta, where the mountains are. Ch I, I don't know. I want to say Chattanooga, but maybe not. But anyway, she's from Tennessee. Um, she's yeah. supposed to fly into Gainesville and appear. Watch Brent. He's frantically trying to figure out who this forensic expert is going to be. But Why can't she appear by um, video conference? If there's no objection. Well, so this first time I've heard the name, we just Googled her. Apparently, she's some kind of handwriting expert. I normally never object to anybody appearing by Zoom unless it's a party or an expert, and particularly if she's going to be referring to documents, showing documents to the court, comparing documents. I absolutely have an objection to her appearing by Zoom. So, and again, uh, it's the first time I've heard the name. I can't imagine how a handwriting expert would have any relevance to these proceedings. There may be Dahlberg objections, things of that nature. There may be more dire that needs to be conducted. Our position is she needs to be here in Levy County. You saw Lynette lean over to Brent. Lynette knows what she did, even though her attorney has no clue what he just stepped into. I agree. So, Counsel, what you're telling me, Mr. Shockey, you're saying that she represents that she expects to have to be in Tennessee on the 10th. As of a minute ago. <laughs> I need it later in the month. That's one day before the due date. So, and the dots are going right now, so she's saying some additional stuff. I know, but and I know you're representing what she's representing to you, but would you like to call? We can call she, her she, if you, you want to take a brief, brief break to talk to her because here's, here's the issue she gets here, it gets here, and I mean, how, we can't make decisions based on the, the prospect that the 10th may be of a baby. <laughs> for lack of a better term, the biological time clock, you know, um, coming to fruition and her need to be there. I don't want to deny her that opportunity by any means, but it's, it's a, I guess it's a scientific hypothesis. I don't know what she knows about the 10th and calling it a due date, but nonetheless, um, it's otherwise impacting our ability to proceed. And I, and I do agree to some extent that kind of a witness is best handled by both counsel in, in person. Um, Your Honor, if they intend to call this witness, I am going to, I'm not arguing with the court, but in light of this new information, I am going to renew my request that the court consider placing this on March 1st. I would also ask, the, I would want to depose an expert witness, obviously. I want to see Silverman depose this expert witness. I don't think he's got the kahunas. I know he doesn't have the hair on the head. There's no way he's going to pull this off, deposing this expert. The number one, the nation's number one forensic handwriting expert who is coming to share that Lynette 100% wrote signs posted them all over Otter Creek saying that Jeremy Hales is the Ohio rapist. Um, we don't have time for um, requests to produce and things of that nature, so I've been asking the court moving over tennis this morning to require that any written work product that they intend to rely upon be turned over to my office no more than 48 hours before, or no less than 48 hours before any deposition in the case. Silverman versus this expert witness would be like a six-year-old in a boxing ring with Tyson. Obviously, we'd have to get with Mr. Shockett's office to schedule that and take into consideration the expert's calendar as well. Um, but again, if I keep coming back to, and I wasn't here for this, but the courts mentioned it several times, the whole 15 minutes to present their case. I don't know how you include an expert in that. But with that said, if they are announcing their intent to call an expert witness, 
There's no pretrial order in this case. There's no witness disclosure. I do intend to depose her, and I do wish to have her information before him. She's available on March 1st. He showed me a text, which just confirmed that. However, just so we're clear, if the court does continue to March 1st, our request to keep the temporary in effect will remain the same. I understand that the additional length of time may factor into the court's analysis, but I wanted to be clear on the record that my client would be asking that the temporary remain in effect. And I think for all the reasons the court has recited, um, which I think essentially comes down to unclean hands on the part of Mr. Hales and counsel, well not counsel, Mr. Hales, as to how they've handled this process, I think that an extension of the temporary is appropriate, whether it's February 9th or March 1st. I may not wash my hands all the time after going to the bathroom, but they're pretty clean. Look at that. Look at those cuticles. I mean, these are pretty amazing right there. And I even cut my own nails, believe it or not. Uh, my hands are clean. So, Mr. Shockey, you need a chance or a moment to discuss with Mr. Hales that if what you're asking for in effect is a continuance to March 1, given the expected unavailability of what you feel to be an essential witness for his case. The court would consider doing so, but it would, it would be subject to the third extended temporary injunction containing language similar to the, the second one, and instead of through February 9, it would be through March 1. I have no problem with the temporary injunction. I don't know if you plan on it, but I have my own kind of obligations. I just need to drive on my road so I don't die. The whole road was going off. Your Honor, okay, yes, he doesn't, we don't object to the March 1st. Um, but again, I just, I know we've revisited this. Mr. Hales is, is obeying by the injunction to the T, including this issue about the public road. Um, and he's said again, there was an accident last week on that, on that road, it's a busy highway. He just wants to be able to drive on the road to get into his property, um, when making it within 50, 100 feet when, when it's their residence instead of 500. That request based on matters previously argued before the court on two occasions is denied. Your Honor, I would ask the, the court, court so please. in light of the new date being March 1st, I would ask the court to permit both sides some additional time on the discovery instead of next Friday the 2nd, I'd ask the court to allow us until Friday the 16th, which would be two weeks before the hearing date to complete the depositions. That's fine, Judge. Okay, without, without opposition, well, all other matters, as I said, instead of the 2-9, excuse me, the 2-2 two, two cutoff date, it'd be February 16. Would the court entertain my or tennis motion to direct uh, Mr. Hales through counsel to provide to me uh, and my office all written materials or other work product um, that uh, this expert would has relied upon or would rely upon at the hearing uh, no less than 48 hours prior to her deposition whenever we are able to schedule that. With the final trial being just two weeks away, they have yet to depose this expert witness. And why would you? He doesn't have the kahunas. He wouldn't dare. If she's got a written report, yeah, I haven't seen it yet, but sure. Well, we're not, we're not going to ambush anybody. We have, a, sure, if we get a report, we'll provide it. Not just a written report, but any materials that she relied upon I'll get you that in forming any opinion that she intends to testify or may testify to in this case. Absolutely. I have the written report. I paid $5,000 for it. And I have all the information that she used to create the report. All the signs. There were 11, double-sided. And then every motion, Lynette ran to the courthouse. All these frivolous motions that have all expired because I didn't do anything wrong. I still haven't done anything wrong, but she knows she's in huge trouble. As a matter of fact, defamation case that's coming towards her, which has already been filed in Levy County, she can lose everything. And I know you may be thinking, but she has nothing. Well, she's got a truck. She's got a camper. She's got property. She could lose it all. Okay, well, without opposition, the court would direct that prior to, 48 hours prior to the deposition of the person proffered as a potential expert witness, all materials relied upon to formulate her opinion and or any reports generated from those materials will be provided to counsel for the petitioner at least 48 hours prior to the deposition. With regards to the scheduling of her deposition, um, as well as any and all other discovery, I want to put a um, cutoff date. We're now at February 16 for the Cook and Hale's deposition. And we could do her deposition by Zoom, I presume. 
the right Mrs. Well, where is she located? Tennessee, somewhere. So, so she, I know you said she's going to be in Tennessee for the birth of the child yeah. or grandchild, but does she live in Tennessee? She lives in Tennessee. Well, uh, yes, given the rules of procedure and the controlling law, I, I would have to consent to a Zoom depot there. Not for the hearing, but for the depot. Right. I would, I would um, be inclined to provide you all uh, opportunity to do so by February 21, which is middle of the following week after the other depots need to be completed. Is there consensus on that? that? That's perfectly acceptable on our side, Your Honor. I yeah. Don't know. Sorry, so, so what was the due, what was the date we had? 2-9? Two 2-16. Two no, the one that we couldn't make it was the 9th? The, Fe the February 9th date is now going to be changed right. to March 1. Madam Clerk, the extended injunction will go through March okay. 1. So her conflict was the 9th, so yeah, that should be what the am. Correct. The baby's going to be that weekend. Yeah. Your Honor, I do not intend to notice Mr. Hale's deposition as a video deposition. The rule certainly permits Mr. Hale's to put the appropriate file and make his deposition a video deposition. Well, I would ask, I would move more tennis this morning uh, that the court direct to both parties, really, we can make it reciprocal, but really direct them, um, that if any deposition is video recorded, whether properly or improperly, well, it shouldn't be done improperly, but if any deposition is video recorded, that it absolutely not be disseminated in any way, shape, or form until we come back on March 1st, and this court is able to rule on that. In other words, he doesn't want you to know anything that Crooks says that incriminates himself. Yes. That includes going on YouTube. That includes any transcript being posted on YouTube. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Without opposition, the court would also direct that neither party, if any depots are taken in conformity with the videotaping of deposition rule, that neither party disseminate or publish in any form whatsoever those depositions until we reconvene and readdress that issue. And through March 1 at 9 a.m., which the, the temporary is going to remain. One the final time. point, if I could, Judge. I know you're not allowing further deposition to occur. And if that's the court so pleases, that's fine. But we should still be allowed to use it. Is that correct, what we have so far, the transcript in, in court to impeach? And if, if, it, if it otherwise meets the criteria for you know, prior inconsistent statement or whatever. The entire deposition is filled with inconsistent statements. It's nothing but pathological lying from a pathological liar. Okay. Yeah, and, and subject to whatever evidentiary objections, I'm not denying anyone the opportunity to present it. I'm not denying anyone the opportunity to make appropriate evidentiary objections at the time. Thank you, thank you Jeff. Okay. I know that the terms of the um, temporary injunction will be contained in the document the clerk is preparing. Uh, in an abundance of caution, would the court permit me uh, at the conclusion of this hearing simply to remain, and I'd like to draft immediately a proposed order for Mr. Shockett's review and the court's review on the discovery procedures we've just outlined so that everybody's obligations are clear on the record. I have time. Well, yeah. sure. Um, so let me ask you how you're, you're going to type it up and forward it okay. to me and we could we'll stay right here or go in the conference room, whatever the bailiff pleases, and send it to Mr. Shockett as soon as I'm done. It should take me about 20 minutes. I'm not saying the court has to sign it immediately. I just want to get it <laughs> consensus on, paper. on the language. Yeah, well, it's fresh in my mind. Well, you can email, right? Right, I can email it to Mr. I might Shockett. have to go back to the office. But I just, I wonder if the court will sign an order that, an agreed upon order that has all those procedures I'm, in it. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'll, I will. I'll execute that without delay. And then uh, lastly, Your Honor, um, I know there has been a lot of discussion on both sides about violations or potential violations of this injunction and an Ohio injunction. I believe there's been allegations of things that have occurred at the courthouse. Uh, I am requesting, um, Mr. Bailiff, uh, that either you or one of your colleagues walk my client out to her vehicle and watch her leave the parking lot. I don't want there to be any discussion about potential contact between these parties, and I don't want to walk her out myself because I don't want to make myself a witness in my own case. Copying is the sincerest form of flattery, right? And that's what he's doing. He's copying what I did because as we got there, Crook was breaking the civil protection order well within 500 feet. George was outside with the Levy County Sheriff. He had to move the vehicle. Should have never been there in the first place. I come in, 
say to my lawyer, Randy, do you want to go bring George inside? Should we have a deputy bring George inside so she's protected from these freaks? And now he's taking what I did before the judge was on the stand and trying to use it at the end. Because we all know he will become a part of this actual lawsuit one way or another, just the way she made feathers when she lied about him. Who knows what she's going to say about Silverman, but I have no doubt she does and will have a ton to say when this is all done. There might even be signs posted all over Gainesville. If you didn't catch that, he tells her, we'll talk later. I want you to get all your paperwork, get in your car, and drive away. In other words, he's actually trying to limit her from incriminating herself even more than she already has done. Gotta love a hot mic in the courtroom, and you gotta love that Silverman is completely and totally ignoring her. And previously, she told Brent, I've never seen them before. And now she's telling Silverman, it's not my writing. He's trying to get me arrested. I've never tried to get anybody arrested. Only people who do things that are foolish and illegal get arrested. People who get arrested get arrested because they got themselves arrested. Nobody else can get you arrested. Just, just so the record's clear, um, because the um, extended injunction, which contains the addendum that was previously added to it as page five of seven, um, signed January 4, 2024, the same language applies in conformity with the Bud Love decision. Just so that you know, I've, I've written in here so that this record reflects that the above conditions will remain through March 1, 2024, dated this 23rd day of January 2024, signed by the that's what I'm and what time? What time? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Okay. And I know I said last thing, but you know, never trust a lawyer when he says that. This this is a relatively unusual procedural posture, and that this hearing has already begun. The evidentiary portion of this. I am now on the record asking or moving to invoke the rule of sequestration, as to any and all witnesses that may potentially testify in this case. I certainly have no problem with Mr. Hales or my clients speak to their lawyers about it, uh, or if the lawyers speak to other witnesses about it but I believe it's completely inappropriate given that the evidentiary portion of this uh, proceeding has already begun um, for there to be um, conversations about the substance of what has occurred in court and what other witnesses testified to. So I would move to invoke the rule of sequestration. Mr. Shockett, you wish to be heard? I mean, it's- No, I, would, I agree. I, that's been a problem in this case that I've seen before. Well, right. So for example, his wife, I believe it's his wife. It's not his wife. Or, well, his significant other, they're on YouTube chatting for hours about what has occurred in court, what witnesses have testified to, what happened at depositions. That is not kosher, uh, respectfully, um, while the evidentiary portion of this case is pending and the rule has been invoked. So now Silverman wants to take away the fundamental constitutional right of the world. He's just trying to do it through me. It's freedom of speech. I can talk about whatever I want to talk about. So, for the record, if you could just state the name of the individual that you're talking about, Mr. Shockett. Well, we saw two witnesses here on their side. We saw um, uh, Russ, what's his last name? Sus. Russ, Sus. The Sus. Russell, Russell, the Russell, the former mayor, the former mayor of Otter Creek was here as a witness. He was here, so that was one. I think there was another witness she had. It would apply equally. It to would apply equally. It applies equally. Absolutely. Right. And then so Martha, I just want the record to reflect so that the parties know it's a little bit unusual because the court would have invoked it at the outset. Mr. 
Mr. Silverman was not present at that time. It was not raised by Mr. Mm -hmm. Feather or Ms. Preston acting on her own behalf. So the court would invoke the rule of sequestration of witnesses, which would include that the witnesses uh, remain outside the courtroom during the presence of, excuse me, the presentation of the evidence, that the witnesses, while outside the presence of the other witnesses, not discuss amongst themselves their testimony or expected testimony, or if they're called before the other witnesses, what they did testify to or what they were questioned about, that any violation of the rule um, brought to the court's attention will result in an inquiry and potential exclusion of their testimony. Um, and so, Mr. Shock, what you mentioned just a moment ago as to maybe the, the mayor or former mayor, I may be mistaken, I thought Mr. Feather represented him as a potential witness he was going to call. That was the <laughs> that was the current mayor. Okay. And then there was the former, so you so, have the current mayor and former mayor. Here's uh, the dicey part because yeah. I want to, I want, normally I would have identified those witnesses if I had them step forward. So the current mayor of the current town mayor. council of Otter Creek, the was, former mayor. That was on our, our potentially uh, might, and potentially may show up, we'll invoke the rule. Okay. On her side was a former mayor and an unidentified person. Um, okay, we're so Mr. Silverman, you're charged with discussing with your client any potential witnesses that she not discuss with them testimony or expected testimony, Mr. Hales, likewise the same, any witnesses that you intend to call. When each witness is going to be called, um, when we reconvene on March 1, we'll have brief inquiry before they're called. The court will inquire, have you discussed this matter with any other than any of the other named witnesses in this case? If so, to what extent and when? Um, and the court at that time will consider potential sanctions for exclusion of them as, as witnesses. But what does this mean? It means any witness in this case isn't going to be allowed inside the courtroom during the case. So George is a witness. She may be sitting outside of the courtroom for days. Or Silverman's going to complain because she lives with me. And I'm not allowed to talk to my significant other about what's happening in not my life, our lives, as their civil protection orders protecting us both. We're calling John as a witness. You think Lynette and John are talking about this? You know, the one, the only, the crook? Of course they are. So we're effectively, you know, midway in the trial, and we're going to reconvene on March 1, which is another, in the balance of all things considered, concern of the court by going that far out. One last housekeeping thing, Judge. The Supreme Court issue, there's a new rule, 1.041, which is not effective until April 1st. So we still have family law 12.040E on limited appearances. Now that we have this, I've asked Mr. Silverman to make a full appearance rather than that limited appearance. The, the rule also required 12.040E that every, every filing, every pleading with the court in his signature line say he has a limited appearance for these purposes. It wasn't followed. That's OK. Um, but I don't think we need a limited appearance at this point. Mr. Silverman, you intend to do so now that you're past the January 26th calendar conflict? Well, yes, I do. We will file a plenary notice of appearance today, and I would note that the motion to continue, which is the only pleading I filed in this case, does note directly below my signature block, counsel on a limited basis for the petitioner. So I'm not quite sure what Mr. Schock is referring to when I did not comply with the rules, but I most certainly did. I would also note that my motion to continue was signed by my client as required by the relevant rule of judicial administration, whereas some other ones I've seen in this case have not been. But um, I'm not so much concerned with where we've been. I'm more concerned with where we're going. And hopefully, uh, Mr. Shockin and I can um, work cooperatively to try to resolve as many issues in this case as we can and litigate only those issues which need to be litigated. At the risk of going down a path that may be unnecessary, the, the record needs to be clear. I've got the notice of limited appearance filed January 17, 2024, at 8.38.04 a.m., it's a notice of limited appearance. It clearly states in the body of it, it's for the limited purpose of preparing, filing, and litigating the motion to continue. That's what happened today. And in the signature block, it's signed by Attorney Joshua Silverman. And under all of the identifying information, contact information, e-service info, it states limited counsel for the petitioner. I didn't mean that. We meant the other filings. It says, the rule says that's currently in effect. Any pleading or other document filed, shall state in bold type on the signature page of that pleading, attorney for a petitioner for the limited purpose of blank. 
and then whatever the that notice said, repeated. Okay. Um, well, it's going to be remedied by a it's going to be remedied. notice of appearance. That's all. I just wanted to get it. acknowledge, um, and we'll we'll proceed. Just give us a minute here. Um, you see the bias just oozing from Craig to Thomasus. So if my lawyer files something and it's hyper technically not 100% correct, even though the deposition was noticed as videotaped, uh, there's a problem. But if Silverman files something and it's hyper technically incorrect, ah, that'll be remedied. We're good with that. Okay. Sir, Mr. Hales, with a copy of the extension of the injunction through March 1. Four hearings, four months, and we still haven't heard a single thing from me in court. But the hearing date is March 1st, and who the hells knows what's going to happen in between now and then.